We must give our self first. Now, if you'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you may. I'm going to read verse 5 to you, and we'll look at it together for just a few moments. Here's 2 Corinthians 8 and 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. That's a reference to the church, the brothers, the believers at Macedonia. And Paul says two things about them. First, they gave themselves to the Lord. You know, the most life-changing thing you'll do is found in that statement, giving yourself to the Lord. You say, well, pastor, I've already been saved. And I'm not talking about what he gave to you, this grace of salvation. I'm talking about, have you given yourself to him? That's a very real commitment. That's a very real moment in time. If you are saved, and by the way, there's nothing more vitally important you can do with your life than get saved. If you're in this crowd today or perhaps watching a live stream or this broadcast today and you're not sure beyond a doubt that you know your reservation is securely held in heaven, I know this good church and there are a lot of folks here who can tell you today or any day of the week you called or came in how to make sure you're on your way to heaven someday. That's the most important thing. Our Lord said, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world and lost your own soul? There's no answer to that because there's no profit in it. To have lived and died without Jesus is to have lived in vain and to die hopeless. But I'm not talking about that very real moment in time when you got saved. I'm talking about that moment in time when you said, Lord, I give you myself. I'm yours. Isn't that what Paul said to the church at Rome? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. That's not extraordinary service. He said that's what you ought to do. Surrender. Give the Lord yourself. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, For I seek not yours, but you. God is not seeking what you have. How can you impress the owner of the earth, everything on it, in it, above it, and under it? How can you impress him with something you give him? Uh, what a joy it is to learn the blessing of stewardship that this reciprocity is the way he returns a blessing back to me and partners with me and lets me partner with him. But you can't impress God with anything monetary. Gold and silver don't impress him. What does he want from you? He wants you. you say, well, pastor, I'm I'm too old. Tell him that. See what he has to say. Uh, this man Moses, remember him? Uh, not, not that you knew him personally. There are some folks I'm looking at might have. <laughs> 80 years of age when he began the most important 40 years of his life. We supported a missionary for many long years, Gerald and Delphia Piper. Pipers were missionaries to Mexico. Gerald was from Texas. Uh, anybody here from Texas? From Texas? Good, good, good. Okay. They say you can always tell folks from Texas. You can't tell them much, <laughs> but you can tell them. Gerald was from Texas, and uh, he surrendered in a missions conference just like this, he and Mrs. Piper. At the end of the conference, they came to the altar. He was a contractor, owned his own business. He installed swimming pools, very, very successful, close to retiring. When God said, Gerald, I think I'll make a missionary to Mexico out of you, and not a board in the U.S. would take him on. They said, Gerald, you're too old to be a missionary now. So he and Mrs. Piper said, we'll go independent, and they did. And we supported them till they went to heaven in their 80s and left a grandson in their ministry. You're never too old to say, Lord, here I am. He may not send you to Mexico. He may not send you to a European country. He might send you across the street. He might send you to a class of little boys or an Iwana club of kids to work with on Wednesday night. But they first gave themselves. And then he said, they gave themselves unto us by the will of God. He was talking about people who gave themselves to serve God. Others. That statement describes the greatest need of the Grace Baptist Church, and I'll bet it describes the greatest need of the Canton Baptist Temple. To find folks, my church, your church, uh, who will love the church and say, I'm going to serve, I'm going to find my place of service with other brothers and sisters in this church. There is a trend, a shift that's, that, that uh, frightens me, that troubles me more than anything that's going on right now in, in the church in the U.S. The attitudes of American Christians toward the church has changed. There is this pop, pop uh, culture, this modern psychology, this me first, this entitlement. It used to be, I started in 1975, 
at, at the Grace Baptist Church. And it used to be when folks would come in who were already saved and knew the Lord, they would be looking for the place where God wanted them to be. And it used to be, Pastor, if God sends us here, where can we serve? I, I mean, we enjoy this, we enjoy that. And, and is there some, something we can do? And I've never told anybody, no, there's nothing you can do in this church. But now it's, it's a lot like this. Well, if, if uh, we decide to come to Grace, what's, what's here for us? You know, an awful lot of folks today in the, the world of good Baptist churches get, look at the forecast on Saturday night to decide if they're going to go to church on Sunday morning. If we're to see a revival in America and gain ground in this anti-Christian warfare that we are engaged in, the church has to wake up. We have to judge our hearts about our attitude toward the church.